And I'd also like to thank you so much, Joy, for coming. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm very excited to um, have this conversation. Um, Joy, of course, curated uh, the Ebony Fashion Fair exhibition. Did anyone see it? Anyone? Yes? Yes. Um, so we're going to talk a lot about that. But before we get into that, I want to just very briefly talk a little bit about um, kind of black fashion in museums. Um, so we're going to start um, with Lois K. Alexander. Um, so you may or may not know that she, this woman um, founded the Black Fashion Museum. So the Black Fashion Museum used to be in Harlem. She founded this institution um, in uh, 1979. And she was doing her master's degree um, in uh, black retailers, looking at um, black retailers, fashion retailers. She wanted to write her master's thesis. And her um, advisors told her, black fashion retailers do not exist. And so she obviously <laughs> knew better. And so she um, got more and more into the idea of black fashion. And she applied for a grant um, from the National Endowment of the Arts and was able to start her own fashion museum. Close second, OK. Great. <laughs> Um, and so she was really groundbreaking in this idea of refocusing fashion exhibitions around um, African Americans. And Joy, please feel free to jump in anytime um, you'd like to comment on any of these. Um, and she really was re able to reach out to her resources to make her, um, make her museum work. So not only get with her grant um, from the national government, but also looking at other institutions. For example, this is a show she did with us at FIT in 1992, um, which is a big inspiration for black fashion designers. Um, and you can see some other shots here, just really fun things. So these pieces um, were part of their, um, her own collection. Some of them were part of FIT's collection. Some of them were loans. Um, and some of them we still have in our collection, which is very exciting. Um, and these are some images from her book that she um, published in 1982, Blacks in the History of Fashion, really important in kind of getting that published scholarship. Because as um, you know, if, unless there's an article written, unless there's a book, it's really hard to kind of trace um, the history of exhibitions. Um, so we're really lucky to have any kind of documentation. Um, and I also want to point out that these pieces, um, that now you can see, are with the Smithsonian, because um, that collection um, ended up moving from the Black Fashion Museum. Um, it was acquired in, in total by uh, the National Museum of African American History and Culture in 2007. And that first it was in, the collection was in Harlem, it moved to DC, and then it was acquired by the Smithsonian. So you can see how it was displayed um, in the Black Fashion Museum and then more currently. So this is a dress um, by Elizabeth Keckley made for uh, the First Lady, Mary Todd Lincoln. And then here we can see a dress, um, this was made and worn by Rosa Parks. So some really beautiful examples in that collection. And um, jumping ahead a little bit in time, this is an exhibition um, that the Smithsonian did in collaboration with um, Google Arts, um, Google Arts and Culture, which is um, a really great resource. If, any, if you guys haven't checked it out, please do. Um, the Museum of FIT has exhibitions there. Um, does Chicago History have any um, collaborations with them? I do. Absolutely. Or they do. I don't work there anymore, but they do have collaborations with them. Um, Google Cultural Institute, yes. And this is a really beautiful way to kind of share um, collections with a wider audience. And you can see there's really some in-depth um, pictures, things yes. that um, you can get really up close and personal, actually much closer than you can get in the gallery. We definitely don't want people standing this close to our pieces. <laughs> Um, but I also want to look at some um, exhibitions that have happened um, in the last few years. You can see that um, you know this is one of the older exhibitions um, that looked at black British style. This is only from 2004. So we're looking at um, kind of a truncated history here. Um, but just going through very quickly to look at some of the ways that um, different museums have explored the idea of a diaspora in their collection. So this is the Museum of the City of New York. Um, so we can see different locations being represented here. Britain, here just the city of New York. Um, and then Stephen Burroughs was also at the Museum of the City of New York. So we have the monographic shows. So again, we can see um, you know, the same type of shows, the same type of timelines that we've seen um, at this mo being discussed this morning, earlier this afternoon, um, that Julia discussed, looking at the monographs, looking at locations. Here we have Patrick Kelly um, in Philly. Hopefully you guys got to see some of these shows. They were really beautiful. Um, again, a monographic exhibition. And what I loved about this show is that it really got into some of the more controversial aspects of Patrick Kelly's designs. You can see um, his look at um, kind of caricatures of blackness, which he really kind of readopted and reinterpreted. Um, here we have um, a very small exhibition, but a very influential one. Um, this is called Black Dress, and this was at the Pratt Manhattan Gallery just a few blocks down. And this is actually the exhibition that inspired my co-curator, Ariel Alaya, to um, propose the idea of black fashion designers, which she then invited me to curate with her. And this is an image um, from that show that um, Colleen uh, showed us earlier. And we can see 
different um, kind of aspects of this show. And this was a show that we really wanted to present a breadth of fashion over time, looking at um, different aspects of black designers, and this was completely focused on black makers. Let's see them here. Um, looking at different um, kind of interpretations. So one way that that di diaspora has been really represented in museums for a very long time is through textile art. And um, so here we have this exhibition um, at Philadelphia that looks at these um, quote unquote African print um, uh, from the Vlisco company um, in Holland. So we're looking at the flat textiles, but then we're also bringing it to the silhouette, which I think is really interesting and a way to really tie together flat textiles and uh, silhouettes. And then this is a, um, these are sh uh, shots of a show that's uh, currently on view in South Africa. So this is their new contemporary arts museum, and this is in conjunction with the 21st anniversary of South African Fashion Week. Um, so these are all contemporary um, uh, designers that they're bringing into their contemporary art museum. So we see these trends all over the world. And then these are just some other uh, exhibitions that I've personally visited where I'm always, I always find fashion in an exhibition, um, whether it's there or not. Um, but this one, pretty obviously looking at jewelry as um, really expressive aspects of um, fashion and culture, women's culture in Senegal. This was at the Smithsonian African Art Museum. And this was a really lovely exhibition, tiny little exhibition at the Met um, that looked at photographs um, from a black photograph studio. Um, in the 1940s and 50s, and the fashion here is just, this is really what jumps out at me, so I really thought of this as a fashion exhibition. And here we have some um, images from uh, Posing Modernity, which might still be up um, on view uptown in Columbia, but again, looking at the paintings, looking at the representation of blackness and how fashion really is such a huge part of that. I promise I'm gonna jump in soon. Oh no, and we're gonna get to the okay. fashion fair. That's what we really wanna hear about. But I just wanna um, kind of go through a little bit about what's been going on recently. This is at Weeksville, Fashioning the Women of Weeksville. This was done by a really great curator, um, Noelle Corbin, um, looking at the collection at Weeksville. If you guys haven't been in Brooklyn, it's definitely worth the track. And this is down in Richmond. Um, so this was an exhibition that really focused on female fashion makers in Richmond, but it featured a dress by Frances Chris, which you can see second from the left, who was a really, um, really important dressmaker in the city and was African-American working at the turn of the century. And then these are some images from um, the National Museum of History and Culture, um, obviously not um, kind of fashion objects, but again, looking at fashion and style and how important it has been for um, diasporic communities. And here we can see um, just some really, um, really powerful examples of clothing and how it really helps bring history to life, um, again, from the Smithsonian. And how important, I want to ask you about this um, a little bit later because, of course, you're now at, um, in Charleston, but the way that fashion can really function in a museum that is not dedicated to fashion or an exhibition that's not dedicated um, to fashion. But now we can talk a little bit about inspiring beauty. So the first thing I wanted to ask you before we get into this exhibition is tell me a little bit about the history of your curatorial practice. What kind of things sure. are you interested in as a curator? Can you all hear me? I just want to make sure. Yeah. OK. Um, so good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here and talk to you. Um, I actually, this is my second uh, FIT symposium. I came to the Black Fashion uh, Symposium and saw uh, Dapper Don. Dapper Dan, yes. Dapper Dan, oh my God, that was like the best uh, conversation of all time. Um, and having said that, uh, it, it's really a pleasure to actually be on stage this time and well, talk very about happy this, to have you. this project, um, which is now about six years old, um, and I'm still talking about it. So um, it is, it sustained itself in, in many ways. In terms of my own curatorial practice, I um, came to museums not with the desire to necessarily be a curator. Um, I ran away from graduate school thinking, um, <laughs> you know, so um, enamored with the ideas and the uh, enthusiasm of my colleagues, but so wanting to share that knowledge with a larger audience. And so um, at the really at the recommendation of my advisor, he, who said you should really look at museums um, if that's what you want to do. Um, I, I approached my career that way, and I did not start out as an ex, uh, a curator. I started out as an ex exhibition developer, which is really this hybrid that exists within history institutions 
that is both about content creation but also about um, audience advocacy. So in many ways it's curation plus education. And I've approached my career or this work, curatorial practice, in, in many ways as that kind of interdisciplinary, um, uh, having an interdisciplinary approach always heavily relying on my colleagues in education who often have more contact with audience members than you do within the, the curatorial department. So my career really started as a way of, of wanting to get knowledge out to the, to the masses and, and finding that museums really offered that as an, op an opportunity. So what kind of exhibitions did you curate um, before Ebony Fashion Bear? Um, so I did an exhibition that looked at the history of adolescence in Chicago. Um, I had the opportunity to curate um, the Chicago installation of Without Sanctuary Lynching Photography in America. I did an exhibition on U.S. history. So mostly my, you know, my, my background is really at thinking through ways of making historic or history information as accessible to audiences as possible. And often in those exhibitions, costume, historic dress would come into play, but not as the focus really as a way to um, exhibit a different idea or to um, really interpret an, another idea, not as the, as the, the focus of the, the project. And it's really interesting because I find that most history museums, culture museums have fashion or clothing in their collections. They do utilize them in all of these different ways, but they don't necessarily kind of take the next step and do an entire show based on fashion. Well, the Chicago History Museum is, is different in that vein because the collection at that institution, the costume and textile collection at that institution is world class, you know, 50,000 objects strong. Um, they had a costume council that basically, you know, deemed that we would do fashion exhibitions once a year or once every other year. So there was already a commitment there to doing exhibitions that focused on historic dress or on our costume collection. But um, for the most part, we always have to look for that social history or cultural history angle in order to do that interpretation. And one thing that we hear a lot um, kind of about fashion collections within larger institutions, at FIT, we don't have to worry about that. We all know how amazing fashion is. But um, you know, sometimes in art museums, fashion is not seen, you know, this whole debate about is fashion art. How about in history museums? How does clothing kind of interplay with different departments? How do the curators get along? Um, as much as you are able to disclose? <laughs> um, well, I think for the, it, de it depends. Okay, so we knew at the History Museum that fashion exhibitions brought in audience. That there was, in, in essence, a built-in audience. Um, people wear clothes. They might not necessarily relate to the Civil War or, you know, lynching photography in America, but um, there is a, is an actual in for these kinds of exhibitions. So, um, the, I would say the, the collection was treated differently than other aspects of the collection. And in some instances, that created some tension or anxiety between departments or between curators. But never, we always saw the, the value of it. Well, that's, that's heartening. Mm -hmm. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Ebony Fashion Fair. We had discussed this a little bit um, before uh, your trip up here, um, but I know that the Johnson Corporation family was very, very involved. Um, first of all, tell us a little bit about Ebony Fashion Fair for anyone who doesn't know. Sure, so for those of you, I'm sorry, I'm shaking, it's cold up here. I'm, all, I'm always cold too. For those of you who are not familiar with the Ebony Fashion Fair, it was a traveling exhibition uh, hosted by the Johnson Publishing Company, the you know, publishers of Ebony Magazine, Jet Magazine. It began in 1958 um, in earnest, traveled for until 2009. And this was, an, this was um, an event, a community event that ultimately brought the best in fashion to um, communities all over the nation, also in the Caribbean. 
Um, it would tour to cities at its height. It toured to 180 cities per tour. Um, so many of these garments that you see here on the stage were worn 150 plus times um, and therefore had their own challenges as um, for our conservation team. But it was a, an event that was both a fashion event but also a philanthropic event hosted by kind of local black organizations as, way, as ways to raise money for their different charitable um, charitable endeavors. So for instance, if you know of the Lynx or if you know of uh, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority or Delta Sigma Theta, they would bring this show to their town, put on this kind of two hour, 130 exit uh, show and sell tickets and raise money for whatever their charitable endeavors were. And this went on for five decades. And one of the things we wanted to really focus on was the breadth of the fashion that the fashion fair brought to these communities, the diversity of the communities. So big cities like New York City and Chicago, but also very small cities like uh, Itabena, Mississippi, and uh, smaller towns like Richmond, Virginia, and Greensboro, South Carolina, and so on and so forth, um, where African-American audiences were basically able to view the, the highest fashion expressions of the day. And we were able to touch on it very, very briefly in Black Fashion Designers because one of um, our huge supporters for the show was Audrey Smalls, who had worked at Ebony, worked with Mrs. Johnson, um, had, was a commentator, and she talked a lot about um, being a model. It launched the careers of a lot of black models and how important it was um, for black fashion culture. Absolutely, the Ebony Fashion Fair really created a platform for models who otherwise might not have had the opportunities to be seen for not just the models, but also folks who do hair, folks who mend the clothes, or you know, going on the road um, as well. And when you talk about Audrey Smaltz, uh, she started as a, as, a, um, as a model, but then went on to be a commentator for the Ebony Fashion Fair, because this was not like, folks, you know, kind of prancing across the stage. This was um, an all-in all entertainment event. So there was music, and there was the commentator who told you how you should wear the garment. I think Audrey Smaltz had a line like, what to wear on Sunday when you won't be home till Monday. And, <laughs> and you know, so kind of really setting the stage for, um, for folks to not only look, but to engage with these garments in a way, and also to engage with them on black bodies. Um, so it really became a way for um, African Americans to see themselves in these garments um, and in an entertainment and very safe environment. So these were clothes purchased and owned by Eunice Johnson. So how um, did the collaboration with Chicago History uh, Museum and the exhibition come together? And what brought you to the project? Sure, so um, our former, the Chicago History Museum's former uh, costume curator, Tim Timothy Long, had tried to kind of establish a, rela a relationship with Eunice Johnson. Um, but unfortunately, she passed away before that could happen. But we were able to um, view the collection uh, at, as a result of a relationship developed with Linda Johnson Rice at that time. And so while the idea was really to just see what they had when Linda you know, saw members of the staff there often, she was like, well, you're gonna do an exhibition, right? Um, and so really it came from the Johnson Publishing Company uh, Timothy started to work on it, then he moved on, and then I was brought on to, you know, the finisher, ultimately, so. So this was a massive exhibition, and I want to talk, I know we're running out of time, which seems unbelievable, um, I want to talk a little bit about these mannequins. These mannequins were unbelievable. I actually was able to see that, I didn't see the show in Chicago, I saw it in D.C., but I did some research at the Chicago History Museum while they were dressing it and the collections manager very kindly let me come in and see where the mannequins were being painted and their hair being done and being dressed. So tell us a little bit about the direction. This is obviously a very directional choice for these mannequins. Um, yeah, and it was not without kind of, kind of its critics. I mean, this is very specific, 
But the idea of the exhibition was to showcase the fashion, yes, but it was also to showcase the fashion in the ways in which it was seen at the Ebony Fashion Fair um, show. So we made a decision to have black and brown models, that they would be fully, um, they would have full makeup, that they, their hair would be done, so on and so forth. So the shades of the mannequins that you see represent the four uh, shades of the Ebony Fashion, of the Fashion Fair makeup palette. And so we requested that those uh, mannequins be made in those colors. And one of the great things about I mean, the reason why we're still talking about it six years later is that it had, went to a lot of different venues. I saw it in DC, but it went to Atlanta, it went to, it went to Detroit, I believe. Um, talk a little bit about that process and traveling this giant exhibition. Well, um, after it left, it, uh, left Chicago or closed in Chicago, the exhibition traveled to seven other venues around the country. Um, and most of those venues or those cities would have been places that had kind of strong relationships with the Ebony Fashion Fair itself. So Milwaukee, Detroit, Atlanta, Washington, D.C., these are all places that um, hosted the Ebony Fashion Fair when it was still in existence. And so those cities hosted this exhibition. Um, and we packed these. We didn't travel all of them. We traveled 41 of the, um, of the mannequins. They traveled all together. Um, uh, they, the, the clothes, the garments were not taken off of these mannequins, so every, they had to be crated individually um, and traveled to seven different venues. And um, they did pretty well, the garments. So, uh, in full disclosure, we borrowed these garments from Johnson Publishing Company because there's no way the Chicago History Museum was going to let these things on the road for basically two years. Um, but what we were able to do once the garments uh, got off the road was turn them into donations to the collection of the Chicago History Museum. So um, we are rapidly running out of time, but I want to ask you a little bit about the International African American Museum in Charleston, a brand new museum, um, and you are their chief curator. I want to talk a little bit about what you see, what role you see clothing, fashion playing um, at this new museum. So first of all, the museum is not open. This is a startup. We plan to open in 2021. So um, if you come to Charleston looking for it now, you'll be <laughs> sorely disappointed. You'll just, it'll just be me. Um, <laughs> so um, this, this museum, what it does endeavor to do is really to look at the interconnectedness of um, the African diaspora as, it, as many folks who, uh, many of the Africans who arrived in North America landed in Charleston. So Charleston is a ground zero in, in where um, African American culture started but also reaching out across the Atlantic world. So to answer your question directly, how fashion will be used in this new museum is, is very much an open question. But I think some of the ways in which the images you showed before, um, fashion as an expression of uh, African, both African and African Americans, uh, cultural and social, and um, also, uh, kind of protest endeavors is one of the ways that I think fashion can powerfully be used. One of a colleague that worked um, somewhat on this inspiring beauty, Tanisha Ford, is looking at um, civil rights uniforms, the ways in which um, fashion, or not really fashion, but style and, and garments uh, really shaped a visual for those folks who were civil rights activist, and I, I think things of that nature are very um, important. And I also think of the interconnectedness between those enslaved persons who created all the wealth for the ways in which some of these garments that we see um, in other collections throughout the world um, were created is another idea to explore. So who was making these things that made it possible for aristocrats so on and so forth to wear these um, gorgeous garments that were not um, that were not made for people the people who were doing the the raw work. I think that's something to explore as well. 
Well, that sounds absolutely fascinating, so I will be planning my trip to Charleston. Yes, please come to Charleston 2021.